We will now analyze the law upon which this entire lesson is founded, namely, the law of increasing returns. Let us begin our analysis by showing how nature employs this law in behalf of the tillers of the soil. The farmer carefully prepares the ground, then sows his wheat and waits while the law of increasing returns brings back the seed he has sown, plus a many-fold increase. But for this law of increasing returns, man would perish, because he could not make the soil produce sufficient food for his existence. There would be no advantage to be gained by sowing a field of wheat if the harvest yield did not return more than was sown. With this vital tip from nature, which we may gather from the wheat fields, let us proceed to appropriate this law of increasing returns and learn how to apply it to the service we render, to the end that it may yield returns in excess of and out of proportion to the effort put forth. First of all, let us emphasize the fact that there is no trickery or chicanery connected with this law. Although quite a few seem not to have learned this great truth, judging by the number who spend all of their efforts either trying to get something for nothing or something for less than its true value. It is to no such end that we recommend the use of the law of increasing returns, for no such end is possible within the broad meaning of the word success. Another remarkable and noteworthy feature of the law of increasing returns is the fact that it may be used by those who purchase service with as great returns as it can be by those who render service for proof of which we have but to study the effects of Henry Ford's famous five-dollar-a-day minimum wage scale, which he inaugurated some years ago. Those who are familiar with the facts say that Mr. Ford was not playing the part of a philanthropist when he inaugurated this minimum wage scale, but to the contrary, he was merely taking advantage of a sound business principle which has probably yielded him greater returns in both dollars and goodwill than any other single policy ever inaugurated at the Ford plant. By paying more wages than the average, he received more service and better service than the average. At a single stroke, through the inauguration of that minimum wage policy, Ford attracted the best labor on the market and placed a premium upon the privilege of working in his plant. I have no authentic figures at hand bearing on that subject, but I have sound reason to conjecture that for every five dollars Ford spent under this policy, he received at least seven dollars and fifty cents worth of service. I have also sound reason to believe that this policy enabled Ford to reduce the cost of supervision, because employment in his plant became so desirable that no worker would care to run the risk of losing his position by soldiering on the job or rendering poor service. Where other employers were forced to depend upon costly supervision in order to get the service to which they were entitled and for which they were paying, Ford got the same or better service by the less expensive method of placing a premium upon employment in his plant. Marshall Field was probably the leading merchant of his time, and the great field store in Chicago stands today as a monument to his ability to apply the law of increasing returns. A customer purchased an expensive lace waist at the field store, but did not wear it. Two years later, she gave it to her niece as a wedding present. The niece quietly returned the waist to the field store and exchanged it for other merchandise, despite the fact that it had been out for more than two years and was then out of style. Not only did the field store take back the waist, but what is of more importance, it did so without argument. Of course, there was no obligation, moral or legal, on the part of the store to accept the return of the waist at that late date, which makes the transaction all the more significant. The waste was originally priced at fifty dollars, and of course it had to be thrown on the bargain counter and sold for whatever it would bring, but the keen student of human nature will understand that the field store not only did not lose anything on the waste, but it actually profited by the transaction to an extent that cannot be measured in mere dollars. The woman who returned the waste knew that she was not entitled to a rebate, Therefore, when the store gave her that to which she was not entitled, the transaction won her as a permanent customer. But the effect of the transaction did not end there. It only began, for this woman spread the news of the fair treatment she had received at the field store far and near. It was the talk of the women of her set for many days, and the field store received more advertising from the transaction than it could have purchased in any other way with ten times the value of the waste. 
The success of the field store was built largely upon Marshall Field's understanding of the law of increasing returns, which prompted him to adopt as a part of his business policy the slogan, The customer is always right. When you do only that for which you are paid, there is nothing out of the ordinary to attract favorable comment about the transaction. But when you willingly do more than that for which you are paid, your action attracts the favorable attention of all who are affected by the transaction and goes another step toward establishing a reputation that will eventually set the law of increasing returns to work in your behalf. For this reputation will create a demand for your services far and wide. Carol Downs went to work for W.C. Durant, the automobile manufacturer, in a minor position. He is now Mr. Durant's right-hand man and the president of one of his automobile distributing companies. He promoted himself into this profitable position solely through the aid of the law of increasing returns, which he put into operation by rendering more service and better service than that for which he was paid. In a recent visit with Mr. Downs, I asked him to tell me how he managed to gain promotion so rapidly. In a few brief sentences, he told the whole story. When I first went to work with Mr. Durant, said he, I noticed that he always remained at the office long after all the others had gone home for the day, and I made it my business to stay there also. No one asked me to stay, but I thought someone should be there to give Mr. Durant any assistance he might need. Often he would look around for someone to bring him a letter file or render some other trivial service, and always he found me there, ready to serve him. He got into the habit of calling on me. That is about all there is to the story. He got into the habit of calling on me. Read that sentence again, for it is full of meaning of the richest sort. Why did Mr. Durant get into the habit of calling on Mr. Downs? Because Mr. Downs made it his business to be on hand where he would be seen. He deliberately placed himself in Mr. Durant's way in order that he might render service that would place the law of increasing returns back of him. Was he told to do this? No. Was he paid to do it? Yes, he was paid by the opportunity it offered for him to bring himself to the attention of the man who had it within his power to promote him. We are now approaching the most important part of this lesson, because this is an appropriate place at which to suggest that you have the same opportunity to make use of the law of increasing returns that Mr. Downs had, and you can go about the application of the law in exactly the same way that he did, by being on hand and ready to volunteer your services in the performance of work which others may shirk because they are not paid to do it. Stop. Don't say it. Don't even think it if you have the slightest intention of springing that old-time worn phrase entitled, But my employer is different. Of course he is different. All men are different in most respects, but they are very much alike in this. They are somewhat selfish. In fact, they are selfish enough not to want a man such as Carol Downs to cast his lot with their competitor, and this very selfishness may be made to serve you as an asset and not as a liability if you have the good judgment to make yourself so useful that the person to whom you sell your services cannot get along without you.